And welcome back to Ladies Can We Talk. This is Debbie George and so happy you joined me. I didn't get adequate time at the end of the last segment to introduce our guests in this segment. And I want to quickly tell you, we do have her on the line. Her name is Kathleen Hartnett White. I've actually had her on the show at least once, and I think twice before this, but she is a, truly one of the national experts relating to the use of energy policy and fossil fuels. And she's a distinguished senior fellow in residence and the director of the Armstrong Center for Energy and the Environment at the Texas Public Public Policy Foundation, one of the best think tanks in the country. Um, And she has a new book coming out called, she's a co-author of, Fueling Freedom, Exposing the Mad War on Energy. I even like the title. Well, so hello, Kathleen. How are you doing, Debbie? (laughs) I'm great. I'm so glad to have you. You know, honestly, the title seems like it should sell the book all by itself. But, um, you know, I know you co-authored this book with Stephen Moore. He's a chief economist at the Heritage Foundation and another great ally of conservatism. So I'd love if you would tell us why, what the point of this new book is. It's called Fueling Freedom, Exposing the Mad War on Energy. What were you and Stephen Moore writing about? Well, we were writing about, Steve and I, become increasingly appalled at the magnitude of whether we call it the energy issue or the climate change issue or the global warming issue and the extent to which it's been really now, it's been going on and evolving for 30 years, but it's now institutionalized and and our um, uh, um, rules um, promulgated by EPA in our country in court decisions and, and across the world, it's the same. And it threatens the really foundation of what I would call modern, free, prosperous life. And there's so much about the history. We're, we're the first living generations in all of mankind's history to enjoy lives swamped with man-made energy at every turn and far beyond our cars and, and all our digital devices and all our, our con- convenient appliances in our, in our homes. Um, that this, those are all as a result of massive amounts of energy through endlessly creative um, conversions and devices. And, and the, the climate issue imagines that we can get rid of, not reduce by 10 or 20 percent, 80 to 90 percent reduction of fossil fuels, perhaps by 2030 or 2050, and there are no substitutes. And I think it's just um, our policy leaders at the nas- highest national level and just the average person, I don't think they understand what's going on. It took me a long time to make this very serious conclusion, but um, um, we have. And the book is an a- attempt through history, through some kind of eighth-grade science um, and um, in energy policy, environmental policy, uh, to um, really lay this out. Um, in, indeed, we have the prospects for a brighter and brighter future because we've learned to eliminate or drastically reduce real environmental ap- um, impacts. But um, the climate issue, the carbon dioxide issue, this is this has um, the magnitude of the impacts have really been overlooked. You know, I remember one time, I just love that. And, I, you know, I was realizing when you were speaking, it's almost an unfair question what I asked you because the the issue is so massive and has so many pieces to it. And I think that the average person not paying that much attention or, or wanting to indulge in reading a lot might just, they hear in the news enough, climate change is a problem and it's caused by fossil fuels and everyone, their brother is talking up clean energy. So I love to start with that your book defends the amazing uh, efficacy of fossil fuels in just bringing um, bringing comfort, bring just lifting mankind out of out of reliance, uh, living in cold and not having enough heat. In fact, I remember a story you told you, you in an out, example you told me one time. I saw you at some conference. You were talking about how you know a remote village in England that's way far from the city because of fossil fuels. People in those remote areas, everywhere in the world, they are more likely to have access to medications, to fresh food, to everything they need because of the existence of fossil fuels to transport those things. I mean, it's lifted the poorest of poor to better and better living conditions. And when we have reached, we we in prosperous Western countries where freedom is enshrined, um, have reaped the greatest benefits, but it really has already um, lifted up 
basic, basic human welfare across the world. In, in 1800 or 1850, which in the grand scheme of things, that's not too long ago. That might be my great, great, great grandmother, maybe even my great, great grandmother. The average lifespan was about 25 to 35. Those were the, 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 the high ones in, in England. It's now three times that. The average income per capita across the world is an average, which includes all the still so, so poor countries in sub-Saharan Africa. The, the average income is increased 10 to 30 percent. And fossil fuels really played a necessary role. They weren't the only, they didn't cause it. They weren't the only thing, but they played a necessary role. When you could take a pound of cotton and spin it into cloth, and it would take you 30 minutes to do that with the uh, mechanized devices fueled by fossil fuels, and it took 18 hours for somebody else. That changes everything. It means human beings are not so much like animals that are just beasts of burden and sources of muscle strength. It, it's opened up an entire new world. But among uh, these are material things we talk about. But think about just this. Think about time. We live three times longer, and that's an enormous gift. That's a gift of time. And we also spend far, far less time just providing food and clean clothes and all just the, the, the basic necessities that every human being in all of this planet's history has had to deal with. We, we've been liberated, uh, and we can use that extra time for, I don't know, we can waste it or we can use it to play poker or we can use it to study <laughs> physics or we can use it to learn how to dance. Become an Olympic can, skier, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we can choose. We can choose choice. Um, before um, the Industrial Revolution, which was the first time harnessed, fossil fuels were really harnessed, um, it, it, it was the first time that it, a middle class emerged. You didn't just have the super rich and all the rest of us that just, you know, used our bodies like a, a horse or an ox um, to provide all the energy benefits to everyone else. And at the moment, the, the crucial thing about, and I appreciate your your common question about, you know, we hear this or that, and we've heard it so long, it's just now part of our cultural vocabulary. Climate change is dangerous and fossil fuels cause it. We don't have an alternative now that can any way begin to produce the amount of energy and just all the energy services. The grand illusion of what I call the climate crusade is that renewable energies can get that job done, and they can't. They can't, and that is a matter of physics. They're they're intermittent. The wind speeds fluctuate by the minute. Um, they it, it, we still after hundreds of billions of dollars of our money subsidies from our government and now have not even five percent from wind or solar or or, or other renewables. And the, the climate crusaders think we're going to eliminate fossil fuels not by ten or twenty percent, but by eighty to ninety five percent. We don't have an alternative, and to dismantle the, the the energy systems and economic systems and social systems we have without an alternative is, is, is the madness that this book wants to expose. So I want to make, you know, if you're the climate, if you're the person not all that informed and you hear that, well, climate change is a bad thing, your book will address, number one, the virtues and blessings that have benefited all of mankind through fossil fuels. It will also address the shortcomings in the alternative energy world and that, you know, they just, as you were saying, they, they can't begin to supply adequate energy equivalent of fossil fuels have. But doesn't your book also get into the whole, the, it kind of it, it attacks a lot of the myths surrounding the supposed danger from CO2. And I'll tell you, I'm just checking the clock here. You have 30 seconds, but your book does get to the idea, I believe, that the uh, fossil fuels aren't causing nearly the damage that the climate wackos claim, right? Yes, and I, you don't have to be a climate scientist or a physicist to ask these questions. I encourage everybody. We are told that the science is absolutely settled, and, and we'll, unless we get rid of fossil fuels, um, we are in great danger. No true science is settled. No true science is settled. And the science that makes this claim originated from the United Nations about 30 years ago, was highly politicized by, at the source, the assumptions that are made in that science and then spewed out in models have, have failed to replicate what real temperature thermometers and what the most sophisticated technology of, of, of remote satellite sensing things. 
Um, we need climate science. It's not that this is not an issue. Of course we should study it. But under the current system that's been going on for three decades under the United Nations, um, it's political and it's not at all as sophisticated as we need to further study this issue. We're speaking tonight with Kathleen Hartnett White, who is a friend. She's also the co-author of the new book, Fueling Freedom, Exposing the Mad War on Energy. Real quickly, where can people get your book, Kathleen? They can go to Amazon.com and just Google Fueling Freedom. It is the coolest book, and it's make you feel better about defending the normal use of fossil fuels. Kathleen, thank you so much for calling in tonight. You too, Debbie.